Thank you, and good evening, everyone. How are you tonight? Good. Uh, thank you first to the Layton Foundation. It's a real pleasure to be here and to have the opportunity to speak to Dr. Newbold and to Debbie uh, Raybold and the staff of BrainWorks for inviting me to come this evening. Um, the work that they do is really incredible and jives so well with the presentation that you're about to hear tonight. I hope that you'll have the opportunity, if you don't already, to take advantage of their programming as you pursue brain health. It's a great opportunity that you have here. What I'm going to speak to you about tonight is your total brain health. We're going to be talking about a little bit about the history of brain health, to put it into some context, and why brain health matters. And then we're going to talk mostly about an action plan, about the 10 most important things that you can learn to do to better your brain health, both in terms of improving your everyday performance, so things such as remembering someone's name. How many of you forget names? You're in good company. It's the number one memory complaint of adult Americans. How many of you lose your keys? OK. So these kinds of things are aspects of everyday performance that we want to work on because they frustrate us and annoy us. But we're also going to talk about what the science shows us in terms of how we can promote better brain health going forward, what we might be able to do to reduce our risk for a serious memory impairment. Now, I'm going to give you a lot of information tonight. And luckily, I have almost an hour and a half to present. What I'd like you to do as I speak to you is to think about, as I give you this information, what matters most to you. I'm going to talk about 10 steps in an action plan. And you have that in your handout. And let me give a shameless plug to the benefit of taking notes as a mnemonic device, as a memory aid. And as I go through these, I want you to not think about doing something in every category, because that's going to be overwhelming. But think about which of these really matter to you and where you can start to take some steps to make some changes to both improve your everyday performance and also to reduce your risk for memory impairment. So let's talk first from a historical perspective about brain health. Brain health is actually nothing new. If we look back at the writings from ancient Greece and Rome, we can see that people spoke then of the importance of memory. And they talked about really understanding, number one, that having a good brain was part of having good overall health. So there was a real understanding of, if you will, a mind-body connection when it came to good cognitive performance and to good memory. The other thing that we see is that in the rhetoric traditions, which was the traditions of oration, because after all, it was harder to take notes in those days. There weren't as many mechanisms. There were no printers and Xerox machines. So people memorized information when they spoke. And the art of oration or of speaking was a highly venerated skill. And memorization, the ability to memorize large amounts of information, was considered one of the five necessary skills that an orator had to possess. And if you look today at some of the more complex memory systems that persist and still are taught, in fact, one of the doctors today at the hospital was talking to me about one that he used and, and taught his kids. Those systems, the PEG systems, the loci systems, come to us from the Greek traditions. Then we jump forward by a few centuries, and we talk about the Middle Ages and the Renaissance period. And here we see this disconnect between the mind-body ideal of the ancient times, so that there's a sense that what happens to our body, how we take care of ourselves physically, doesn't matter as much to our brain function. And in addition, the use of these mnemonic systems, these PEG and loci systems, moves into the tradition of the churches. So if you look at the writings from the churches at those times, and that was where a lot of academic work, for example, did take place, you'll see the use of those systems persist, but in the study of things like religious text. Then we jump right forward into the modern era. And we see that interest in memory improvement really becomes something that is for entertainment. 
And this gentleman is someone by the name of Harry Lorraine. Does anyone in the audience know who Harry Lorraine is? Anybody see him on the Johnny Carson show, perhaps? That ringing a bell? So Mr. Lorraine, who still works and does memory training, is an entertainer, as he says himself, and not a memory expert, and not someone who would talk about the science and the workings of the human brain. But he is someone who would go and perform, and for example, in this audience, would memorize the name of everyone in this room. And actually, I once heard it said that he would then have everyone stand up during the show and tell everyone named John to sit down. Okay, And over half the audience would generally sit down. So he used these techniques to a degree to memorize large amounts of information as a showman. We also see these kinds of techniques taught in the workplace. There's an absence of a health focus. So there was really no discussion of the relationship between what we do day to day in terms of how we take care of ourselves and our brain health. And particularly in the um, 80s and 90s, a real advent of the use of supplements. So this idea that there were things outside of uh, scientific thought in the Western culture, uh, specifically thinking of things like ginkgo, that could support our brain health. Well, now here we are today. And this, I have to give credit to the uh, memory program at, in St. Louis at Washington University, is their slide demonstrating the typical boomer. Okay? It always gets a laugh. <laughs> but really, what uh, this signifies is that the boomers are revolutionizing brain health. Why? Because we're concerned about all these things, right? About all these changes and also about changes in memory. There are about 78 million baby boomers, and in the same way that they, they have driven as a generation the fitness craze, right, the physical fitness craze of the 70s and 80s, they're now driving interest in brain health. So where are we today? Well, I would suggest to you that first we're today driven by public interest in successful aging, and in part because of concerns about disease, including increasing rates of Alzheimer's disease, but also because we just simply want to know what we can do to take care of ourselves and to promote better and more successful aging. We know from science that there are a, there's a lot that we can do. There are new findings all the time about brain aging and about what we will call neuroplasticity, okay? About our ability, the ability of our brain to promote new neuronal growth, to grow new neurons to grow new connections, and to maintain health in that way, even as we grow older. So this is a pretty radical change from when I first started in this field, when it was thought that our brains were basically static, that we were born with a certain number of neuronal cells, and that's what we got. So this is something that's a really big shift, if you will, in the field in how we look at the brain and aging, and how we understand what the human brain is capable of going forward. Brain health is getting more and more attention as a public health issue. You know, the very fact that you're all here to, for a lecture on brain health says that. And we know that the Centers of Disease Control and the National Institutes on Health and Aging are interested in promoting brain vitality and in looking at questions around brain health. Finally, there's increased commercial interest. So you may see products out there for brain fitness. You might see software programs advertised that claim to improve your brain health. And that's where we are today. Why is brain health matter? Let's just take a step back and talk about that. Because one of the things that you might wonder is, is this really important? Is this something I really need to pay attention to? Well, First of all, brain health, when I talk about that, and it, it was interesting because um, we were speaking earlier today a little bit about whether people understand what brain health really is about. And I think if I asked you all what it means to forget, how many of you would be able to relate to that as an experience? You forget something, right? You forget, I asked already about names, you forget where you parked your car. Does everybody remember where they parked their car? Do you remember where you put your car keys? Good, because you're going to need that. 